Hi everyone, and uh, my name is Samir, and I'm based as based in Sydney as a chief uh, principal architect for the routing and switching working in Omdia. And today I'm here with uh, Neelish. Uh, he's a business development and also the chief technologist for the HP Hewlett Packard Enterprise based in Singapore. And we also have very seasoned professional, uh, Mr. Nathan Wick, who is working as the chief architect for the Juniper based in Asia Pacific region. And today we are all here to discuss about the new evolution methods and new evolution technology for the 5G network architecture. Uh, we already know that 5G is you know, getting a lot of hype around the world from last few years. And then now with the with unprecedented COVID-19 since last year, so last 18 months, um, most of the CSPs want to trigger 5G standalone architecture. They are moving towards uh, 5G standalone architecture. They're blazing a new grounds. And the purpose for blazing a new grounds for the 5G standalone architecture, as my understanding for many years in the industry, is that enterprise verticals are the revenue generators for them. Most of the use cases they are looking for the enterprise verticals rather than for the consumers. So in 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 uh, keeping them short is like B to B or B to B to X is business to business to X is making more synergy more hype as compared to business to consumers. And I remember four years back when we started 5G, we all talking about e-mobile broadband like enhanced mobile broadband or the videos and all that stuff. But now the things 360 degree is changed. CSP is more concern is for enterprise verticals because where we talk about the low latencies, we talk about service based architecture, we talk about the cloud native architecture and last but not the least open RAN. And then that open RAN is getting a lot of fame around the world and technologists like including Nitin, Nilesh, I myself now as a chief analyst or the senior analyst for the media, but before I was in, in, in the vendor side. So we talk a lot on the open RAN. So what we do, uh, Nitin and Nilesh, in this discussion, and I would uh, need your uh, opinions as well, that we can start with the open RAN, that why open RAN is getting attraction, getting a market traction adoption, and then we move our discussion towards a transport network. Why transport network is very important for bridging between the cloud native core, 5G core, and then the RAN, right? Because if yep. you only touch the RAN, then it not serve the purpose not even from from uh, from analyst point of view not from juniper from the hp or he will pack it you call it hp is more famous nilish right correct me yes yeah. absolutely but uh, but we are now spin-off uh, company so there are yeah. many uh, spin-off from hp parent original one so we are hpe now yeah, so that's right. why you know some people more 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 about hp <laughs> but but HP, but, yeah. but but there are a lot of people from original hp uh, myself yeah. i also joined in original hp the blue color logo yeah, yeah so that, that 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 that's another thing you know for hp is a, one of the yep. very yep. seasoned yep. company in the industry so let's start uh, i think uh, i'm not taking much time but i need your intervention your opinion so we can start with Neelish, I think, and then uh, yep. I mean you can and then Nitin, you can feel free to interrupt us in the middle of and then feel free to yep. share your opinion because we have plenty of time. And I think I want audience to be, you know, fully uh, understand the concept of open RAN from our experience. So uh, Neelish, what do you think about the open RAN traction uh, that is getting yep. in the market now, including APEC? I know you base in APEC, yep. but yep. other than APEC and all over the world, including the North America usually, and then what is about the market adoption rate? What are the challenges and drivers attached to open RAN? So it's a, it's a couple of questions, but I try to squeeze in one. What about attraction for open RAN? So please, so, please tell us so something. Th on. Thanks, thanks, Samir, and thanks team here to invite me here. So uh, as you have already introduced myself, uh, so I look after the uh, telco business development for uh, Asia Pacific, Japan and India region uh, based out of Singapore for HPE. And uh, from an open RAN is a very exciting subject, exciting uh, Kind of a transformation that is happening in the core of the telco networks and what i believe is that the ma major traction driver for the open ran is the better tco economics of the of the things that telcos are looking for so until unless you get at least 20 25 to 30 or 35 percent uh, savings on from moving from a legacy uh, a vertical stack of uh, radio access network deployments that used to be done in 2G, 3G, 4G world. If you are not getting that uh, kind of deployment of, of uh, TCO, better TCO economics of at least 30 percent, uh, the telcos would not be uh, would be interested in that. And in my opinion, that is that is what has actually been proven already. 
if we see the engagements that are happening and uh, I would say those are the public references already now uh, means they have announced in public like Verizon in United States when uh, uh, and Rakuten in Japan they have shown to the telcos world that the RAN can be disaggregated uh, from legacy vertical stack to an open RAN and uh, the, there are immense benefit for adopting to the virtualized RAN uh, means there are multiple target areas, whether virtualized RAN or open RAN and within virtualized RAN, there are C RAN and D RAN perspectives. So we'll discuss more in uh, detail about that. Uh, but I see uh, uh, the better TCO economics as a number one point. The second one I would see the uh, the virtualization technologies have improved and matured a lot uh, considering from uh, the uh, uh, from the word of core a network when 4G uh, packet core or uh, virtual AMS like voice over LTE solutions have been already been virtualized in the 3G and 4G world and that uh, that phenomena you cannot stop to go to the far edge locations of the of the telco networks right right so this this is bound to happen and with some of the industry standards like Open RAN uh, Alliance and the TIP uh, Telecom Infra project basically promoting that uh, as part of the 3GPP uh, uh, kind of overall umbrella. So I think uh, you cannot stop that. And the third thing is uh, I would say uh, this, the ecosystem of partners is very important in driving the Open RAN. Means many of the uh, traditional network equipment providers are basically who were not so much of interested because you know it, it is a dent on their uh, very critical revenue part right and now there are niche isvs have come in, uh, uh, in into the open ran world and the traditional naps have to follow the path so so the ecosystem of partners is developing and uh, that is that is very specifically from uh, even from uh, i would like to highlight here what hewlett packard enterprise is doing in this space is to be be part of the open ran alliance and providing uh, industry standard uh, open and distributed infrastructure management and the optimization infrastructure platform, which will be used to deploy the virtual RAN, MEC and private network workloads onto the far edge locations, whether it's on the cell tower sites or the enterprise locations. So that's where I see uh, what is happening from uh, from the open RAN traction perspective. Uh, Samir. OK, uh, thank you, Nilesh. I think you squeeze all the answer very well and very comprehensively define my long question and I will come back to you because you already highlight about the TCO economics, uh, the mature, maturity of the virtualization and that is my my pain point, right? I am very much interested to yep. know about virtualization, but yep. before yep. coming back to you, I would like to throw a very important question on Nitin because I know Nitin working in Juniper as a chief architect and Juniper is a big name in the industry, right? Everybody knows for the for the telco infrastructure. Uh, don't you think, Nitin, that this virtualization that he mentioned before, and it, um, of course, Nilesh, and then he talked about the TCO economics, that's going to be a threat for Juniper, uh, to be honest. It's sorry to ask for a very blunt question, but but I know that the tier one vendors like Juniper and all big names, uh, they don't want to see that ecosystem you know, very healthy because, of course, their legacy, their vendor deadlocks, they have a lot of investments there. So considering all this, I mean, I mean, scenarios what is your take on on open ran sure i think uh, samir this is a very important question not just for vendors like us but also for operators who are our customers and who rely on our infrastructure to build these networks today right so just like uh, we are looking at what the right answer is for us our customers are also looking at the same thing at you know what the right solution for them is uh, and you know uh, when you talk about uh, the whole open ran ecosystem uh, there's a lot and virtualization there's a lot of talk about virtualization disaggregation uh, what makes sense uh, to virtualize at what point inside the network etc right so from a juniper perspective we are taking a very pragmatic approach to this uh, you know first thing is that we we uh, our approach to this is that uh, this needs to be done where it makes sense. For example, I think this whole uh, intent of, of going towards Open RAN uh, makes a lot of sense because, uh, uh, you know, some of the points that Nilesh uh, brought about, uh, uh, you know, how uh, this is going to break the vendor lock in, how it's going to bring in new players, how it's going to, uh, you know, reduce the cost uh, of operating the networks for uh, the operators. I think another key factor there is what new innovations is this going to bring? How are we going to do new things by using this open RAN, et cetera, right? And so, so anything that uh, fosters that kind of creativity uh, makes a lot of sense uh, to bring in, right? So from, from a vendor like Juniper's perspective, uh, what does that mean and how are we looking at uh, transforming this? 
first of all, uh, uh, you know, this we see this as a as a significant inflection point uh, for how operators are going to run their networks, and uh, uh, we think that uh, making the right decisions in the right parts of the network makes a lot of sense. So, for example, if disaggregation is the question, uh, in my view, the answer is uh, that uh, uh, we have to answer what is the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, so, for example, if you look at just the RAN ecosystem itself, right? In the RAN ecosystem, uh, we talk about the CU components and the DU components and the traffic that's required on all of these, right? Now, uh, for some of these uh, components, it makes sense to run this on disaggregated white box kind of hardware because uh, it just gives you better economics to do that. But uh, if you think, for example, for the front hall, uh, you know, where uh, you are, you have just uh, you know raw bandwidth that you, that you need to carry uh, does it make sense to do disaggregation at that point or does it make sense to uh, you know look at purpose built hardware to do that right so so uh, the way we are looking at this is that we are looking at uh, the problem in different parts of the network and applying the right solution wherever it makes sense for example uh, you are uh, looking at a dran kind of architecture it makes absolute sense to go disaggregated to look at a white box architecture on the cell side but if you're looking at a more uh, centralized RAN kind of architecture where even the CU is getting distributed, then we don't think that it makes sense at the cell side. And you know, this is this is just talking about uh, the cell side infrastructure. You know, you look at uh, similar decisions in the aggregation, pre-aggregation, even inside the telco DC. So so it depends on what your use case is and where it makes sense. I think it makes it's it's absolutely uh, you know the right thing to do wherever it makes sense. No, no, I, I, I do agree with you. But the thing is, uh, what my my uh, feeling is on the on the open RAN is that who is actually driving that one? We talk about open RAN alliance is driving, right? But what we are missing is the missing of standard, right? So when we have missing of any standard like 3GPP or or other or suppose GSMA or other organizational bodies, right? It's only that call for some operators and some vendors, right? To be very very open on that one. Yeah. Uh, though I understand this can reduce TCO, but I really like the answer you mentioned is not everywhere is where where we need it, right? That that makes sense. Uh, but if we talk about the white box vendors uh, perspective, right? Not from Juniper, HP or other other big names. They said that they are massively throwing open RAN everywhere because CU DU separation is there like control pane and and you know the distributed unit plane and then is, is the best way to deploy. So I my personal take is without the proper standardization i'm not thinking it should be a i mean good win in in coming future this is my personal opinion and not from omdia and then from from juniper and hp correct me if i'm wrong nilesh and with nitin, nitin so, i mean i we need both of you guys to, to sure. talk on yeah this. so may, maybe i can i can pitch in here first so uh so basically in my opinion uh the standards issues will come more and more when we are going into an open ran world uh, so, you know, when we see from a telco deployment perspective, uh, there are certain nomenclature is being used, whether we are going for a cloud RAN or a virtual RAN or an open RAN kind of stuff. Uh, so that that kind of uh, uh, mixing terminology is being used. I would say uh, means the uh, first step is from moving from legacy RAN to a virtualized RAN. In virtualized RAN, you are only virtualizing the your existing legacy RAN software stack that used to used to basically deploy on your baseband units right now. So you are virtualizing the baseband units into into a containerized or a virtualized VM or a container world with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, running of uh, the I won't say white box kind of thing. I would say industry standard infrastructure components that what HP is providing and even Juniper is working on that front as well. And uh, when we say virtual DU servers or virtual CU servers, these are specialized industry grade standard servers which are pro, which are powered by technology power uh, 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 providers like intel nvidia etc uh, who are who uh, we are the technology partners to and basically making sure that that we provide uh, a tco optimized virtual du and virtual cu appliance server model to run those virtualized baseband units or the new uh, 5g 
uh, virtual DU server, which will not only take away the cell site router and front hall gateways, which were deployed in a proprietary fashion earlier in the 4G world, it's, it's getting virtualized into the DU uh, virtualized uh, distributed unit appliance server model. So in that way, I don't see the standards will be of a stumbling block. But the way the standards will come into the picture when we open up the next phase of the uh, the, uh, the RAN that we say into the open RAN, where we are basically uh, getting into the software stack, uh, also getting into uh, split into the L layer one, layer two, layer three, coming from best of breed of vendors who are more expert in that in that particular domain and then there is an interoperability comes into the picture and this is what i believe the open ran and tip alliance is looking into that along with the partnership of 3gpp in general to prom promote the open ran going forward so in my opinion the uh, the first phase of virtualized ran is bound to happen uh, and i don't see any standard stumbling blocks to come into the into the picture right now yeah, yeah, Nilesh, I, I, I agree with you on this one. But before going to Nitin, I think Nitin, the same question to you. But yeah. in addition to that one, that why 3GPP is also reluctant in in you know uh, throwing its its hands in 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 disaggregation, right? The reason is they released 16, 17 already out. Open Alliance is already there from last two years. The Rakuten already pitch very high, right? They now call it Rakuten model, right? Uh, so now, even though the, the reality is there, why TGPP is so reluctant in, you know, uh, in, in jumping into the op open RAN sort of stuff or disaggregation, though yeah. the all, all benefits are there, what Neelish already mentioned, right? So I need your answer on that one as well. Yeah, so uh, let me just, uh, you know, step back a little bit, um, Samir, and, and just go back to one of your initial questions where you mentioned, uh, you know, some of the uh, inhibitors for people adopting ORAN. And, and I think what you mentioned around this, uh, the standards and all that, is, it's it's a big deal, uh, uh, you know, for specifically for tier two operators to pick up a technology like ORAN in the in the condition that it is in right now. Uh, so it's not for the faint hearted. I mean, it's it is, uh, uh, you know, for the uh, the frontline runners like uh, Rakuten or Tish who are willing to put in the effort and the investment and the uh, development cycles to make this work end to end, right? So so this is definitely an ecosystem that um, uh, you know is is still is still very nascent, very early in its uh, evolution strategy. So I think uh, the model that uh, that this will eventually settle into is probably going to be a mix of what we have today, which is uh, completely 3GPP or GSMA driven, uh, to uh, uh, and also not a model that uh, that seems to be prevalent today, which is just run by uh, the alliances. So so this has to be a hybrid model where both of these are going to come together so that we get uh, the agility of these alliance models, but also the reliability that you get with these 3GPP uh, kind of bodies, right? So um, now the reasons why uh, this has this has been uh, slow in terms of adoption, whether it is 3GPP or uh, you know customers, etc. I think. Uh, you know, this is this is just generally around uh, industry traction. I think it hasn't reached uh, that tipping point where uh, you know the, the wheels are are running. Uh, you know, in a in a smooth manner. Right now, we are still uh, you know in the early cycle where we are still kind of um, oiling the wheels and and getting them to work. So uh, once it gets into that stage, you know, you you you've seen that it took Nokia some time to get on board with the whole open brand story, but they are now very gung ho on it. But we still have to see this from some of the other vendors. So and. And of course, they very heavily influence the 3GPP standards today, right? So I think it'll take some time for this to tide to turn. But I think the model has to be uh, that it cannot go back to the 3GPP model. It has to be this hybrid between these alliances and 3GPP. And okay. and, and even also just to comment on uh, Nitin's point is that uh, even if you see uh, the traditional nets like Ericsson, Samsung, uh, just like Nokia also uh, plunged into that one. So it was driven by uh, companies like Mavineer, LTO stars of the world, right? So they they were pushing this open RAN concept very heavily, and now the traditional NEPs have also realized. So they are basically mixing up this 3GPP and what Open RAN and Tip Alliance is basically uh, promoting. So so I believe there will be a common uh, breaking point in between and move forward on that one. But 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 Nilesh and Nathan, you didn't I mean have any notice in the past that if we implement the Open RAN, right? There yep. is another another block of stumbling block is about the operational efficiencies, right? If yes. I have any problem in my network being as a CSP, like one of the big name, yep. suppose in in US or in Malaysia or UAE, right? Now, 
if tomorrow any problem, I am going to talk with my white box vendor who bring the hardware, or I am going to talk with my software stack vendor, or I am going to talk with my orchestrator who actually orchestrating my everything, right? Yeah, yes. For me, being as a CSP is a, is a nightmare, right? Correct. So what what is your expectation on 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 the operational efficiencies? Both I mean I need so, NAS so, from you. So may, may, maybe I'll just quickly comment on that one. So yes. uh, as I mentioned in my previous comment as well. Uh, see, the thing is that the uh, one of the challenge and stumbling block I would say from an open RAN deployment perspective today is the uh, the risk of disaggregation that telcos are facing. That uh, they have faced this problem in the core virtualization world as well, and uh, they were not happy to virtualize their core network like EPCs and IMS of the of the world, etc. But eventually, they realized that uh, we need to go at least uh, virtualize the core. Uh, with the support of the traditional NEP itself, and uh, slowly that happened, right? So same thing will happen on the RAN area as well. But what we are missing today in a very important point is, is the global system integrator, GSI, what, what I will call it. Until unless the uh, the traditional NEPs, uh, when they will come with their cloud RAN or virtualized RAN piece, because they do their own on system integration, single neck to choke, what what we call it is from, from the telco's point of view, from an operational operational efficiencies point of view, uh, that will be still managed by the traditional NEPs. I don't see there is no uh, different model than what is uh, observed in the core network today. Will 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 come into the uh, case for the virtualized RAN as well. But when it goes from a virtualized RAN to open RAN, when the telcos like Rakuten and Verizon are and even group like Vodafone at the global level is trying to do with the best of breed architecture where radios are coming from different vendor, the RAN software stack is coming from different vendor, transport layer is coming from different vendor, the, the white boxes or what we call virtual DU appliances are coming from different vendor, then the importance of a global system integrator being a single neck to choke is very important. And in my opinion, there are players who are coming into this piece and will remove that uh, risk and disaggregation risk for the telcos going forward and uh, means means uh, there are only few today but i would see the ecosystem growing for that uh, in the coming days to come yeah and it actually looks very you know optimistic on this one <laughs> and I, I really appreciate but but time will tell but again Nathan, yes, what is your true. what is your take on on that one about the operational efficiencies being as a juniper right yeah. because i know you guys expert on on doing managing all the software you know patches and hardware uh, versions for the roadmap, especially for the roadmap, right? Yeah. But now you cannot feel, I mean, there is a missing of product lifecycle, product roadmaps in white boxes because they're just a the metal boxes, right? No, absolutely. And I think uh, we have seen some of these uh, cracks show up. Like, for example, uh, you know, let me give you a slightly orthogonal example just from the perspective of disaggregation. There's a lot of talk around, uh, uh, you know, adoption of white boxes and, and uh, operating systems like Sonic inside, uh, uh, let's say, the data center or inside the transport networks, etc. Uh, so what we've seen is uh, that, uh, you know, once you start to bring these together, let's say, for example, Juniper, we're very keen to work uh, like we, we have solutions where Sonic is sitting on top of a Juniper platform. We've looked at uh, Juno sitting on top of a white box and all of these different combinations, etc. Right. Uh, so you're so you're right in the sense that there is always uh, uh, you know these uh, these gaps that we find when when we do uh, testing of this kind. Uh, for example. Uh, you know, Sonic might be great for, uh, let's say, a data center use case, but it may not have all the functionality that is required for, uh, let's say, a van transport uh, kind of a use case, etc. So, uh, so from a from a provider perspective, this is definitely a challenge on how uh, you manage this this complexity, right? So, I think uh, the way this is going to evolve is that the operators are going to pick. Uh, the complexity that they are comfortable with, depending upon their uh, appetite for risk. Uh, you know, we've already seen the uh, the some of the new incumbents like Dish and Rakuten really show their appetite for the risk and you know pick this up on their own to to drive this. Uh, and then we are going to see some of these other models evolve. One of these models is the GSI model that uh, Nilesh mentioned. Uh, uh, we've also seen guys like Rakuten and uh, uh, a few others, um, you know, step into this uh, system integrated kind of roles where they want to offer these services out of the cloud. And then we also have to look at uh, how this the OTTs are going to come into this play and say, okay, you know, how are they going to bring, uh, you know, some of these solutions together in a in a packaged or a managed form? I mean, so far we've been talking about um, the OTT is playing in the MVNO kind of role, but now we start, start starting to see them move into the edge cloud, private 5G, those kind of ecosystems as well. So it's a matter of time when they will start
start to host uh, these um, VRAN uh, workloads on their ecosystems and start offering that as a managed uh, offering. So I will. So that is why I think the adoption of ORAN is going to be slow. We're going to see maybe about 30% or so in the next five to six years. Um, and, and that is going to be the players who are comfortable uh, to pick up some of this risk based on their appetite. And for the rest, I think we will see this once the ecosystem matures more, we'll see this follow. Yeah, Nitin, thanks. I think you explained very well. Uh, but now uh, you already touch about the transport network. Right? So my next quick topic is need your intervention about the transport network. We also seeing that open transport is also getting very famous and we call it disaggregated routing, right? And Juniper is a big name for routers, right? So considering the DCSGs, the, the distributed cell site gateway or in aggregation or pre-aggregation all the way towards core other than the data center. I, I understand data center with Sonic is a different game is, is maybe applicable. But what do you think about the future for, for TIP that already running that project or the open source or that all that communities right running uh, open transport when there's just plug and play for the metal boxes with any other third party software, right? Yeah. So will you think that that paradigm will be successful in coming next two to three years, even though they are announcing a lot of success in the world now that is plug and play is done, right? So what is your understanding? And then I come back to Neelish. Sure. I think uh, two to three years is definitely optimistic. Uh, two to three years, I think, is uh, a phase where we will see some initial trials and, and uh, you know, some maybe limited adoption. But uh, for this to move towards a wider scale, this will definitely take longer. And again, coming back to the point that I was making previously around uh, what makes sense where. So that is how we are looking at it. For example, as you know, Juniper, uh, we make our own uh, ASIC chips as well. Uh, and uh, then we also work with uh, with Merchant Silicon like Broadcom, and then we work, uh, you know, in these ecosystems like with the white boxes, etc. So uh, for one of the examples that Nilesh was hinting towards, where uh, we are looking at uh, a specialized, um, uh, you know, maybe an Intel-based hardware sitting on the cell site hosting the DU and also hosting some of the cell site uh, router use cases. We think it makes a lot of sense for uh, customers who are willing to take on that risk uh, to manage that uh, ecosystem on their own, right? And of course, this will evolve over time. But in terms of technology, if you see, uh, it makes sense to do that because the, the requirements of bandwidth uh, from this uh, DU to the CU is not very high. Uh, so, so it makes sense to be able to virtualize that ecosystem and put that on the, um, on yes. the uh, virtualized hardware. But, but 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 what what Nitin already explained, I know that Nitin case is the Juniper case and, and I know their routing platforms are very strong. But Nilesh, as part of the, the team technology team for the HP, don't you think that uh, for you this is, I mean, any chance for transport network one or if it is a chance then you are pitching as a white box vendor in transport network? Uh, because I, I, I didn't hear anything about for the HP on the transport network. Yep. Except the so, five big names. To be to be yeah. honest, I want to understand your. Yeah. So yeah. so basically, we we are not directly into the transport network per se, but uh, we are there in the operation subsystems layer or OSS where we provide our infrastructure management and operations tools uh, that come as part of the HP offering for open RAN even for the core network. From an uh, HP point of view, what we are providing is is a, a specialized uh, and optimized industry standard virtual DU, virtual CU server platform from an open RAN perspective. But we do a lot of other things for the core network NFE infrastructure as well. So the focus today is on open RAN. So specifically, when I say the virtualized DU up, uh, server uh, that we have optimized and designed for open RAN and virtualized RAN deployments, it carries the uh, uh, agnostic capabilities of handling the transport uh, uh, processing that is uh, the ECP traffic coming from radios via the front all gateways and the cell site routers in generally in the legacy RAN deployment. Now what we are providing as part of our HP virtual DU server appliance uh, uh, technology is that uh, we are basically able to process the EC pre traffic on the front hall, uh, uh, the network interface cards which are there on the server, which is basically virtualizing the virtual RAN, uh, virtual BBU software workloads running on top of that. And it has the capability of the PTP time sync capabilities and uh, the, the, the interface NIC cards that are there in the server can handle the GNSS and GPS time features capability as well. And basically uh, process this uh, traffic of the radio antennas 
via the EC pre protocol onto the virtualized use server and send that traffic, process traffic through a mid hall ne network traffic back to the virtualized CU in the centralized or regional pop locations. So, so, so that is the uh, the amount of traffic which is completely filtered out, in my opinion, uh, which is going towards the virtualized uh, CU sites on the mid hall traffic, and then it's processing towards the core network. So that is where the focus uh, from an HP point of view, and we work with partners like Juniper as well in many projects together as well as part of but, the overall. But, 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 but sorry to interrupt you here. You mentioned you work as, yep. a, as a partner with Juniper. I think now in yep. Open Transport, you can work as a separate, independent competitor yep. to Juniper as well, to be honest, because, yeah, because yeah, Open, consider, open Platform is yeah. there, right? Yes, considering cons that's why I'm uh, I'm treading a bit cautiously on this <laughs> on this yeah. particular one uh, yeah. uh, uh, panel discussion here. But at least what I can see uh, is that from uh, the cell site router front hall gateways, uh, which used to be part of the core transport layer pro uh, kind of ecosystem, is getting virtualized. Means it's getting onto onto the virtualized DU server that is known. And uh, and by the way, it's it's not a uh, kind of a secret sauce anymore because the when I mentioned about the TCO economics of the of the virtual RAN and open RAN deployment. If this is not been done, then the telcos will shy away to deploy open RAN, yeah. in my opinion. So, yeah, so but, that is that is where the things but, uh, but, but you mentioned about the secret sauce, but I want to again pitch back to Nitin, right? Uh, don't you think this is a big threat for you guys that if the white box becomes successful, then yep. uh, it's very sorry to ask for this very blunt question. But the thing is, this is this is a beauty of panel discussion, right? Then the, the legacy of tier ones, including Juniper and four other big names, they are out of the game because if it is successful, then why being myself as a CSP, I'm going to buy heavy routing, you know, platforms from Juniper, Junos and, you know, the Broadcom silicons. I can go for cheaper silicon and plug and play all done. Right. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me kind of uh, qualify that uh, statement a bit. Uh, uh, so we spoke specifically about uh, the uh, a very specific use case where we are talking about DRAN and where it makes sense. Uh, and uh, like I said, Juniper is not shying away from that because we see that even in that ecosystem, we bring a lot of value uh, for that soft virtual or containerized cell site router that needs to sit on that platform. Because you know, if you ask our customers, they still want to see segment routing. They still want to see SRV sig. They still want to see IPv6. They still want to see policy-based routing. All of those features on that virtualized platform. The, the requirements don't go away. It's just a different form of deploying it. So we're not shying away from it. And we see a unique proposition that we bring there. But you look at everything else. Look at front hall. Look at uh, how you're going to deploy your pre-aggregation or aggregation or the lean edge or your core router. So there is. Like I said, wherever it makes sense, we are going to we are going to do the right thing for that ecosystem. Like for example, uh, Juniper, uh, if you know, uh, you know, our, our MX platform has been our bread and butter for uh, the edge uh, routing solutions. But now we are very carefully looking at what is the requirement in the pre-aggregation and aggregation locations. These no, these sites are going to explode in terms of in terms of number of uh, locations that they're going to have, and the requirement there for the customer is to bring down the cost. So that what we are looking at now is that how do we move away from uh, you know these custom chip-based uh, deployments in these locations to moving towards uh, merchant silicon, which gives them a, a good enough uh, capabilities for what they require but also uh, is not something that they can get out of the white boxes. So, so what we're trying to do is look at what makes sense from our uh, uh, you know, operator ecosystem. I mean, we've been in these networks for, for so many years. So uh, you know, it's very easy for us to kind of separate the hype from what, what really works and what doesn't. And wherever we think it makes sense, uh, we adopt that technology. Wherever we don't, uh, you know, our customers generally tend to agree that it makes sense to move towards uh, maybe. I I, I, I do agree with you, you know, it's not easy to beat the legacies, right? The legacies are there. They having a lot of experience from last 40 years with billions of investment there, but they are also claiming they can do the segment routing V6 or MPLS control plane. Traffic engineering is pretty good with the white boxes, but, but still, you know, we are very limited with the time and this very interesting topic going on. I would love to talk more and we can discuss more, but as we are running out of time, just a quick question and a quick, I mean, I need both of you to answer about the, the core network. What about, I mean, what is your thinking for the 5G core and standalone architecture? I mean, why it is considering so important in cloud native and a quick uh, Nathan, just we can start Nathan, then we come back to the and then we uh, finish up all the session. 
Just yeah, a quick so one. My perspective, uh, Samir, the, the biggest thing that the, this cloud native is going to bring is the opportunity for customers to distribute this across edge, edge networks. So whether it is distributed UPF, MEC, uh, all of these technologies gives them a lot of flexibility to do that. The second thing is it uh, opens it up for innovation. So when you do MEC or when you do things like uh, RAN intelligent controllers, you're able to bring in the developer ecosystem in a much more easy and friendly manner for them to be able to develop on top. So for me, that's the biggest takeaway for the cloud native 5G core. Thank you. Thank you. And Nilesh, you please. Yep. Uh, so, in my opinion, uh, it's inevitable. So, the thing is that uh, the stand, uh, the standalone core uh, may will take some time because uh, the telcos and CSPs are trying to monetize on their uh, the investments that they did on the 4G deployments very in the initial part of the uh, last few years, right? So, they need to move very cautiously from an NSA to SA world. But eventually, uh, as Nitin mentioned, uh, it is very important that the cloud native uh, technologies like uh, Kubernetes, Docker's are very mature now and most of the functions that uh, the uh, traditional NEPs and the even the new niche ISVs are writing on the on the uh, standalone functions running on Docker's and Kubernetes is uh, very much uh, going to give uh, innovations uh, for uh, for the edge applications, industry use cases to be developed for high bandwidth, low latency applications at the far edge location as well. So easy to deploy access to the developer ecosystem that uh, that even the public cloud vendors, hyperscalers are bringing into the picture. And uh, from an at least from an Hewlett Packard Enterprise perspective, we are bringing the right set of technologies on the cloud layer. Uh, even uh, the model that we call it is a green lake as a service model which we offer uh, our entire set of portfolio technologies as a service uh, to be deployed on a cloud native architecture uh, to deploy a 5g standalone core network function in a in a in a containerized world so in my opinion it's uh, it's 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 going to happen means we are already doing trials with many many csps on that one today yeah so i think i think we we discuss a lot and and i think we nothing left as as on the major side we left already. I think this is uh, the beauty of the panel discussion. And I do agree with you all that openness is the right way, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, if I summarize the whole session. Uh, and then we don't need to be shy away being as a legacy vendor or the legacy enterprise vendors, right? Uh, yep. Because this is a trend is not only open and is about open transport and maybe the open core, we call it as a cloud native, right? And 5G standalone architecture would be totally different what we started couple of years back, right? So before we started just for winning the regional race, become a competitive number one in the region. But now it's more about the service based architecture, right? And about the new use case and enterprise and openness is, is the way forward, right? Though the standards are missing and sometimes I also very much against of openness because I know it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's short in the darkness, uh, but 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 that short sometimes work and then hit, you know, it's not like a, any more uh, it was like a game, like a free game has just become a real, real meaning in some, 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 uh, some sort of time. But it takes time, uh, two to three years more. Um, and I think I would like to uh, summarize with that we can continue this type of sessions even next communication Asia or Asia Tech Singapore, and we have a more fruitful discussion on this topic. So thank you very much, Nilesh. Thank you very much, Nathan, for your time. And and, you. and looking forward. And I hope that audience will learn something from uh, from this session. Uh, thank, you thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, Nitin. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you.